Hi guys. So this video is kind of an overview on the concept of infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis is often also called bacterial endocarditis. You might hear um, both words used fairly interchangeably, both in this video, in the notes, and in the clinic. Um, myself, Dr. Hartley, and Dr. Shaw, your pathophys discipline directors, all kind of came together mm -hmm. to write mm -hmm. these course notes um, that are associated with the micro portion of this. So as you're reading through the course notes, you'll note that they don't exactly follow the same format that a lot of my notes have in the past. There's kind of shades of that and then shades of probably what looked like something somebody else wrote, particularly Dr. Hartley. So follow along and I'll kind of go through this video and try to point out some helpful things as I can. Okay, bacterial endocarditis, or IE, is basically either an acute or a chronic disease process that basically results from bacterial invasion of a focal area of endothelium of a heart valve leaflet or cardiac chamber. Um, so it can be the valve, and we certainly talk about the heart valves a lot, and patients with damaged heart valves are at higher risk. But it can also be the cardiac chamber. It's not limited to the valve portion of the heart. It's basically anytime you're having um, inflammation within your heart. And the key feature of this is actually that you have continual shedding of the microorganisms um, within the blood. So if you watch the next video that shows up later in your notes that basically goes into the various organisms that cause infective endocarditis, I talk about biofilms and how they form and then pieces of them break off and then go back to seed and create new vegetations. And that's really just talking about this continual shedding of the infecting microorganisms into the bloodstream. Um, and this kind of highlights one of the key features of infective endocarditis. It's really persistent um, because these vegetations can get rather large and can kind of reseed themselves. Um, so active disease, if it's left untreated, can last for a long time, weeks to months. Um, and for that reason, this has typically been referred to as subacute bacterial endocarditis. But that's kind of an incomplete story because infective endocarditis can also present as an acute infection um, of the heart valve, and that can lead to a fulminant course, which can end in death in a few days or a week. Um, and so if you have an acute infection, pretty much any time you have an acute infection, urgent diagnostic and therapeutic decisions have to be made, right? Are you going to use empiric therapy and find then the effective antimicrobial therapy that you need to initiate right away? Um, and how you choose to handle treatment of your patient can depend on a variety of factors. So there are kind of several risk factors that are associated with infective endocarditis. The first are the patient-associated risk factors. These are things that the patient just kind of is or does that predisposes them to developing infective endocarditis. So um, patients over the age of 60, always in kind of a higher risk category, right? Um, and that's true for infective endocarditis as well. Um, men, men are at a higher risk for infective endocarditis kind of inherently. Intravenous drug users tend to be at a higher risk for infective endocarditis. Why? Well, remember, some of the organisms that cause infective endocarditis are things like staph, like staph epidermidis, which we find on our skin. And if you aren't cleaning the skin properly before injecting a needle, you can introduce skin flora and other contaminants into the bloodstream, which basically increases your blood's exposure to this organism and the likelihood that it could potentially form a biofilm, like say, on your heart valve. Um, there's also some drugs of abuse which actually induce valvular damage. Valvular, valvular damage is a comorbid risk factor for IE development. The last one that we take into consideration is patients with poor dentition or a dental infection. And this is because a lot of the organisms that we associate with um, infective endocarditis are actually oral flora. Um, they're present in the oropharynx. And when you have poor dentition, the likelihood of them getting into the bloodstream kind of through um, bleeding gums is a lot higher, or if you have an infection in your mouth. So 
All of these are your patient associated risk factors. So we just covered the patient associated risk factors. These are your comorbid risk factors. So these are things that the patient already has that contribute to the likelihood of them developing um, infective endocarditis. So the first one is structural heart disease. Um, in these patients, you're going to want to just kind of treat them in advance of any sort of invasive procedure, including like routine dental work to avoid them developing infective endocarditis. Valvular heart disease also represents a risk, and this would include patients who previously had rheumatic fever or rheumatic heart disease, mitral valve prolapse, mitral uh, regurgitation, aortic valve disease, and any other valvular abnormalities. An abnormal valve is much more likely to get infected um, and cause infective endocarditis than a native or normal valve. Um, and the risk of IE in patients with mitral valve disease, uh, like mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation, can be five to eight times higher than in patients with a normal mitral valve. So you can see this represents a pretty considerable risk. Um, specifically, mitral valve uh, IE has actually been associated with the viridans group of streptococcal organisms, which you can hear about in the next video. Um, aortic valve disease, sclerosis, stenosis, or regurgitation is actually present in 12 to 30% of IE cases. So if your valves are not working appropriately, you're at higher risk for developing these. Um, in your notes, I do kind of a rehash of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease as well as the Jones criteria. You can find these notes certainly in this packet, but you can also find them back in Jamie Lopez. And then I know that Dr. Poole was doing a further write-up on um, rheumatic fever for this case. And then there are also some osmosis videos. So you'll wanna check those out so that we can have a more complete conversation regarding rheumatic fever. All right, so congenital heart disease, that's another comorbid risk factor. Um, these lesions, which predispose patient to infective endocarditis, um, include aortic stenosis, bicupsid, aortic valve, pulmonary stenosis, ventricular septal defect, um, patent ductus arteriosus, um, coarctation of the aorta, and tetralogy of flow, which you already learned about, right? Um, and then also prosthetic valves. Anytime you have a prosthesis, Bacteria like to stick to it. Just kind of think about that. Anytime you have something that isn't normally there, isn't homegrown, bacteria are going to want to check it out. Um, if you've had infective endocarditis before, that's actually considered a comorbid risk factor. Um, so anytime a patient has previously had it, we automatically place them in this higher risk. Um, recurrent IE occurs in about 5% of um, patients, so it's pretty important. And remember earlier when I said anything that isn't homegrown is more likely to grow bacteria? Well, still true. Presence of an intravascular device and chronic hemodialysis is actually a comorbid risk factor. Bacteremia associated with the presence of an intravenous catheter or an invasive intravascular procedure are all causes for healthcare associated infective endocarditis. Um, just kind of things that we keep an eye on in these patients. Okay. There are largely two types of bacterial endocarditis, acute and subacute. That's pretty simple, right? So how do we break this down? Well, acute bacterial endocarditis typically, not always, but typically occurs on a normal valve with a virulent organism. So what does that mean? Normal valve would be like somebody who doesn't have some sort of structural issue or isn't having a prosthetic. Um, it's going to occur on a normal cardiac valve endothelial surface. Sometimes it'll occur on a prosthetic valve, typically within two to three months of the plantation, implantation. Okay, now remember virulent organisms. So let's think about this. This means organisms that are pretty fast growing and pretty nasty. All right, so what do, you, what do I want you to think of? First off, strep aureus. That's a big one for this one. Also, group A strep. Strep pyogenes is not to be messed with just because you had it as a kid. And then strep pneumo. Pneumonia is pretty nasty. So is bacterial endocarditis caused by strep pneumo. Um, the microorganisms are these virulent gram-positive cocci 
and they cause these rapidly evolving and frequently lethal infections. So you have to kind of figure them out quickly. Staph aureus, as well as the other coagulase, um, sorry, as well as the coagulase negative staphylococci, actually have a great capacity to infect these newly implanted prosthetic valves. So in those situations, you're going to kind of keep more of an eye on staph. Um, as I mentioned, you can get strep pneumo in group A strep, and you can get bacterial endocarditis from group A strep or strep pneumo, even if the patient isn't showing symptoms of some other systemic infection. Um, occasionally, you'll see a patient who has like a lobar pneumonia that then develops bacterial endocarditis due to strep pneumo, but it, not always. Sometimes it just kind of happens on its own. Remember that strep pneumo is actually found in the oropharynx. So it can just kind of get into the bloodstream, particularly in patients with some of those patient-associated risk factors and cause trouble for the heart, okay? Um, if you have a patient who has an aortic valve infection with strep pneumo, remember the other thing we worry about with strep pneumo is that pneumococcal meningitis. Um, and then there's also gram-negative bacteria that have been associated specifically in drug addicts and patients with prosthetic heart valves, but they tend not to be as common. Okay, subacute bacterial endocarditis. So what does that mean? We're talking about an indolent or slow moving infection of typically, but not always, but more often an abnormal valve this time and often less virulent organisms, okay? So let's break this down a little bit. Acute is typically a normal valve with a fast growing virulent organism. Subacute, an abnormal valve with a slow growing, less virulent organism, okay? Um, the less virulent organisms, typically we're talking about your viridans streptococci, which you can learn about in the next video, and the enterococci, which you can also learn about in the next video. It doesn't really matter which order you watched the videos in, this is just kind of how I placed them in the study guide. Okay, like I said, these organisms are often, but not always, commensal organisms of the oropharynx and the intestinal flora. Um, that's certainly true for the viridan streptococci and the enterococci. Um, these relatively avirulent organisms can colonize endothelial surfaces that were previously damaged by rheumatic heart disease or abnormal cardiodynamics associated with congenital cardiac malformation. Um, so that's where we're kind of seeing the risk factor and why it's an abnormal valve more often associated with it. Um, the predisposing factors to endocarditis with the enterococci are actually kind of specific. With enterococci, we're worried about things like pregnancy, instrumentation or surgery of the genitourinary tract, and colon cancer, which are all kind of associated with enter enterococcal infections in general. Because remember, the enterococci are normal um, microbiota of the gastrointestinal tract. So during pregnancy, um, instrumentation or surgery of the genitourinary tract and colon cancer, there's the opportunity for the enterococci to be displaced outside of its normal zone into the bloodstream and colonize a heart valve. Okay, so what does it look like clinically? So clinically, for specifically your subacute endocarditis, you're going to see um, weight loss and fatigue and night sweats. With both acute and subacute, you can see these things, but sometimes it takes time for some of these symptoms to be reported. Fever and chills, those are going to be reported regardless. But fever, chills, night sweats, weight loss, fatigue, these are all nonspecific symptoms, right? But even though they're nonspecific, they are all associated with bacterial endocarditis. And it's kind of the hallmark of this persistent bacteremia that is necessary. So how does this happen, this persistent bacteremia? Well, part of it is the septic emboli. So I talk about this in the next video, but if this is kind of my heart valve, right? And then I grew this giant vegetation of bacteria, okay? So your vegetation, your biofilm, isn't just the bacteria, it's the bacteria and the extracellular matrix. And then as the blood is kind of like rushing by, that's a lot of force on this vegetation. So then a chunk breaks off it, okay? And that's those septic emboli, these chunks that are breaking off. And those do two things. One, some of the bacteria can then deposit and form a new vegetation over here. Two, they can be dispersed throughout the bloodstream. So if it goes to the left side of the heart, 
The emboli can travel to the brain, the spleen, the kidneys, the joints, and really make their way on the blood highway wherever the heck they want, among other places. If, the, if a right-sided valve is, affected, is infected, then it's pretty much only going to go to the lungs, right? That's just kind of the structure of the body. What's interesting is that we can actually kind of hear this because you're going to see a new cardiac murmur in about 85% of patients. So this infection really affects how the valve works, um, which leads to us being able to hear this murmur in a lot of the patients. There are also some strange findings that we associate with um, uh, bacterial endocarditis. These aren't seen as often, but certainly have been associated with it. Roth spots, these are basically retinal hemorrhages with a very pale center. Um, petechia, you can see petechia on the palate, the mouth, the conjunctiva of the eye, but you can also see it kind of on the skin if it's really become um, like full vasculitis throughout the body as more and more of these emboli spread throughout the body. Um, on the extremities, you can see Janeway lesions, which are basically non-tender hemorrhagic macules on the palms or soles, um, which are shown here. Um, you can also see Osler nodes. Um, Osler nodes are actually painful nodules on the pads of the digits, right? So you can see those right there. Um, and those are actually caused by immune complexes, right? So, hmm, I wonder what type of hypersensitivity that would be. We're talking about immune complexes that are just kind of positing somewhere. Anyway, something to think about. And then splinter hemorrhages, which you can see here. See these lines? This isn't a new fun way of painting your nails. These are little hemorrhages that you can see under the fingernail there. Um, diagnosis. So diagnosis requires a couple things. First off, at least three sets of blood cultures need to be drawn before antibiotics are um, administered. Before, before, before. If you give the patient antibiotics and then you take their blood, you might have killed off the bacteria that is causing it and you won't even know. So three sets of blood cultures should be drawn before the antibiotics are administered. Do it from different sites, so different arms, whatever and ideally space them one hour apart, okay? This way, you're gonna be certain it's not a transient or intermittent bacteremia. Um, you wanna be able to know, is this intermittent or continuous? Is this real? Or is it even true? Like, did you just not prep the skin well enough and that S. epidermidis that you saw on the first collection wasn't there in collection second and two and three? So whoever prepped the skin didn't prep it clean enough. Um, that would be, you know, kind of a false positive. And so this way you can be more certain. For adults, a true blood draw is 20 mLs of blood, okay? Um, and they should be sampled per culture set, all right? So you need a minimum of 40 mLs of blood should be culture, cultured at the time of each blood draw because you need two tubes. Um, and a blood culture set is two bottles. So one for anaerobic growth, one for aerobic growth. The anaerobic bottle has to be collected first. Why? Because you're introducing some oxygen in when you put the needle in. So always do your anaerobic bottle first. Keep checking the blood cultures after you start giving the antibiotics. And that's when you're gonna find out if your drug is actually working. You've given the antibiotic now, did it actually work? Are your blood cultures becoming clear or negative? So that's how you can diagnose it from the blood standpoint. The other way you can do it is the transesophageal echocardiogram, the TEE. This is an ultrasound of the heart and it's performed through the esophagus. The other more common type of echo is actually a transthoracic echo, TTE, and that looks at the heart through the chest wall. It's less invasive, but actually this TEE gives you such a better view of the heart. So it's better at diagnosing valvular problems. It allows really good visualization of the heart valves. And that way you can look for valvular vegetation or abscess, basically bacterial gunk growing on the valve. Okay, how are we gonna treat the patient? Well, first off, if the patient's already sick, you're gonna treat them. We'll talk about prevention in a minute. So if your patient is stable, we're not gonna worry about empiric therapy right away. Wait for the blood culture results before starting the antibiotics. We don't want indiscriminate use of antibiotics. Um, so wait for the blood culture and then prescribe accordingly. If your patient is unstable, begin an empiric therapy after, remember, after you have done all three blood draws. Um, and that's gonna confirm the presence of the bacteremia um, by blood smear, okay? Empiric therapy needs to cover for a couple things. It certainly needs to cover for staph. And anytime we're worried about staph, what are we worried about? MRSA, right? Um, it needs to cover for strep and enterococci. 
So here's the problem. Your enteric oxide, not so good with VANC. VANC, they're resistant to a lot of the time. So that's what VRE stands for, all right? But vancomycin is really good for MRSA. So what do you do? So you're gonna do vancomycin plus the cephalosporin plus the macrolides. So you're gonna kind of throw the kitchen sink at them and then you can pare it down as you know what's going on. Because the infection is in the bloodstream, antibiotics have to be given IV. Oral antibiotics aren't gonna do any good. Once the patient is stable, they can be discharged from the hospital, but you're gonna keep treating them at home with an IV via a PICC line or peripherally inserted central catheter for a really long time, typically about six weeks. A recent study said that you could go down to four weeks without um, killing the patient, um, but six weeks is kind of the standard currently. Patients who are more unstable, um, severe valvular regurgitation or something like that, may need surgical repair or replacement of the infected valve in addition to the IV antibiotics. Okay, so what if your patient isn't sick, but they have heart abnormalities, and you're concerned about them becoming sick because they're going to see their dentist? We encourage patients to see their dentist, so this is a good thing, and we need to protect them. So if a patient has a heart abnormality, you can do prophylactic treatment with antibiotics. I know, I know, I'm telling you to treat a patient who is not currently sick with an antibiotic. You all think I've lost my mind, but I haven't. In this case, it's important because prophylacting for a patient is one single dose about an hour before the procedure. That's not gonna do a ton of damage in our war on antibiotics. But if you do it all the time after, because you'd have to keep them on drugs for six weeks, Man, that's a lot more exposure to antibiotics, right? So what are we going to do? Patient's going to the dentist. If they have previous history of infective endocarditis, heart abnormalities, um, or certain respiratory tract procedures that they might be getting done, like a tonsillectomy, a bronchoscopy with biopsy, you're going to treat them prophylactically. The patients who need this would be patients with prosthetic heart valves, a history of infective endocarditis, unrepaired cyanotic heart disease or congenital heart disease, or a patient who has had a heart transplant, but that transplanted heart had valve problems. It's not like when patients get transplants, they get to like go to a store and look for a high-end heart that doesn't have any problems. They need a heart. They don't really care what condition it is, as long as it'll beat, because theirs isn't beating so good. So some of those have heart problems. That's okay, we can still use that. We just have to treat them prophylactically, right? Okay, so what are you gonna do? Prophylaxis, typically it's penicillin or cephalosporin one dose, one hour before. Now, I just told you that one of the things we have to worry about is MRSA. And the other thing we have to worry about is enterococci, uh, cocci, right? And enterococci are typically resistant to VANC and penicillin. So why are penicillin and cephalosporin good prophylactic drugs? Well, because the bugs we're really worried about when a patient goes in for a respiratory tract procedure or a dental procedure are your viridan streptococci, strep pneumo, um, and group D strep. All of these are organisms that live in the oropharynx, and all of them are pretty susceptible to these drugs. The enterococci, remember, we get these from the gut. MRSA, we get that more often from the skin, and it's not a huge concern in this case. Um, patients who are allergic to penicillin or cephalosporin, you can give them clindamycin instead, and as same rules apply, just one dose of oral antibiotics, one hour before procedure, and they won't be on drugs for the next two months because they'll have avoided bacterial endocarditis. And that's it.